Hello and welcome to the Amplifying Scientific Innovation video podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sophia Onye, Onye, founder and CEO of the Sophia Consulting Firm, a life science marketing and communications consultancy that was established in New York City with the goal of amplifying scientific innovation. The goal of this podcast is to showcase the importance of science advocacy, health equity, and influential leadership through conversations with senior life science leaders who share their unique leadership journey, corporate vision, and industry outlook. My guest today is Mitspat Setji, General Manager, Screening Business at Exact Sciences, a global leader in cancer diagnostics. Exact Sciences' purpose is to change lives through earlier, smarter answers across the cancer journey. I had the pleasure of meeting Pat when I was a Pfizer Summer MV associate with the Lyrica personalized multi-channel marketing team in 2015. She in turn introduced me to the amazing Ellen Wingard, who continues to serve as my leadership consultant for over six years now. And I'm sure she's played a pivotal role in Pat's career as well. Pat, you're truly a world-class leader and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the show today. Oh, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you so much, Sophia. It's my pleasure. So my first question for you is the same as I would ask every guest, which is, what is your definition of scientific innovation? Oh, great question, Sophia. Yeah, I think in terms of scientific innovation, our teams embody scientific innovation every single day. And as you mentioned, we work to bring new great tests to patients across the cancer continuum. That's what we do at Exact Sciences. And innovation is one of our core values at Exact Sciences, right up against teamwork, integrity, accountability, and quality. And now we've grown so much over the last two and a half years I've been here. We have over 6,300 colleagues who are relentlessly wow. working to deliver these new solutions while wow. combining that scientific rigor to help us meet our mission of eradicating cancer and the suffering it causes. Wow, that's really powerful. And it really also ties into my second question for you, which is what inspired your transition from working at the Pfizer Global Headquarters in New York City, where you spent 15 years to the medical diagnostic space at Wisconsin-based Exact Sciences. Tell us more about that. Oh my gosh. And you know, Sophia, I love New York City. And I still <laughs> giggle when I think about the fact that I moved away from there after spending about two decades in, in this in the uh, try sit in that area, but yeah. um, it was a simple but bold mission that drew me to exact sciences. And as I mentioned, our mission is to eradicate cancer right. and the suffering it causes. And that's through the tests that help prevent cancer, mm -hmm. detect it earlier, and guide treatment. Hmm. And Sophia, you know, the facts are pretty straightforward. One in two men and one in three women will develop cancer in their lifetime. Wow. Yeah. And exact, we believe cancer is detected way too late. Mm -hmm. For me, mm -hmm. you know, we're, my focus is on colorectal cancer screening. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when colorectal cancer is detected early in early stages, nine in 10 people can survive. Wow. But when it's detected in the late stage, only one in 10 survive. Wow. So most of our time and energy, as you know, and everything that we've done in, um, at Pfizer is focused on post-diagnosis and end-of-life care. You know, that's what we have been focused quite a bit in big pharma. Right. And outcomes are difficult to influence at that point. Right. So that's what really drove me to come here. And, and it's very personal for me. So I think, you know, uh, Sophia, 18 years ago, my dad passed away from pancreatic cancer. Wow. He was only 59 years old. And wow. my brother and sister and mom felt robbed. We only had two and a half months to say goodbye, you know, and get everything in order. Um, we he fought the good fight and we fought that good fight with him, recognizing that that time was short. So we went to his weekly appointments. And the care team was there for us as much as they were there for him. We helped him get his affairs in order so my mom would feel supported. And it was my dad who helped us make that difficult decision to stop chemotherapy because he too was a physician, just like my brother was. And he knew what his options were better than we did. And so there's so many stories like this here at Exact Sciences that drove people like me to come here um, to join our mission on behalf of our dads and our moms and our brothers and sisters. Um, so what inspires me every day is hearing those stories and the passion that every single person here at Exact has for that mission. 
Oh, that's really inspiring. Thank you for sharing that story. It's really purposeful, changing lives. That's really what exact sciences is about. But I'll be remiss if I didn't ask you, how is the transition from New York City to Wisconsin? Can you tell us more about that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a, it's been a, a very interesting transition. I had to learn to drive a car again. <laughs> I had to learn how to go into a big box store and buy groceries <laughs> instead of just dropping by my CVS. So, you know, you're still living in the New York City area versus, you know, a, 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 a smaller town. But it's been fantastic, especially in the middle of this pandemic. It's more right. space, the parks, and, you know, just the, the area has been nice. Right. And Exact Sciences is truly a mission-driven company. So I think that the location seems almost irrelevant, right? Because the work that you're doing is so purposeful. So thank you for sharing that. Now, I'm curious then, in terms of your evolution, how has your role evolved at Exact Sciences from your initial role as the VP of operations to your current role as general manager for the screening business? Yes, uh, you know, I came to Exact to support our CEO um, to help things run more efficiently as his VP of business operations. And at that time, it was more of a chief of staff role. But a few months later, because things grow so quickly, when I came, it was a little under 2,000 people, and now we're over 6,500. Wow. Um, my, my team grew to include corporate affairs, commercial operations, organizational engineering. And just a year ago, I think Kevin came to me and asked me to become the general manager of screening of the business unit here. And yeah. so I assumed that role and that I took over marketing and medical affairs. We built a health equity team, as you know, mm -hmm. um, the commercial insights and analytics team and, and, our, and our primary care sales force, our specialty sales force and the health systems team. So it's been an amazing experience. <laughs> and we've been able to get, I mean, 2 million patients screened in wow. 2021. Wow. Despite the pandemic, so wow. it's, it's been fantastic, and uh, it's just been a, a, a great privilege. That's awesome. I'm now curious to learn even more about this company. So can you provide a top-line overview of ongoing work at Exact Sciences? Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, <laughs> at Exact Sciences, we are changing the way we think about detecting cancer earlier and treating cancer. So we're committed to impacting patients across the cancer continuum from the early detection all the way to providing life-changing treatment guidance. And uh, as you know, our our portfolio of products includes our Colgar test. You can see it in my background here. It's, it's that box that you've seen the commercial on for the at-home colorectal cancer screening to our suite of the Oncotype DX tests. Uh, which delivers those actionable insights to tell you patients whether they need chemotherapy or not. So, you know, the impact of chemotherapy can be um, really, really tough. So it informs those treatment decisions for patients and for doctors. But what we're really excited about, Sophia, is our future and how we're going to build on the success of Coligar and the Oncotype tests. So our R&D team is so focused on looking at 15 of the deadliest cancers. Wow. Including multi -cancers screening. So, I mean, like we said, cancer is often detected way too late, and we're just motivated to develop those solutions to those deeply rooted needs of the people that are impacted by cancer, like like I was and like so yeah. many else. So, so yeah. Yeah, and I, I had to give a shout out to your communications team as well, because I've seen a lot of the educational work that you're doing on Twitter to really educate people on why it's important to screen. Early intervention can help to save lives. So thank you so much for sharing that overview. But I think we've talked enough about exact sciences now, right? I want to learn more about you and this amazing leader that you are today. I'm curious to know what are some of the leadership challenges that you have faced as a woman of color and what are some coping strategies that you have adopted over the years just to help you get through and be the amazing person that you are today? Oh, well, I think the same of you. So uh, <laughs> you have a lot to share as well. It's an interesting question, Sophia. Yeah. You know, given, given the last two years, there were some major challenges, right? Yes, uh, yes. I mean, the events that we've seen have uncovered conversations that needed to happen after mm -hmm. the murder of George Floyd mm -hmm. and even the anti-Asian sentiment made mm -hmm. worse by the pandemic, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, I think you've been talking to a lot of folks on these podcasts. I've been yeah. listening to your podcast and Thank organizations, you. they responded through DNI initiatives mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they've all recommitted to recruiting talent uh, to reflect the diversity of our customers. And, um, you know, here we focus a lot on the unconscious bias in our listening sessions across the organization. And we've asked our leaders to educate themselves and be aware 
of what their teams are going through. So right. just an easy example is um, language matters, right? Yeah. Yeah. Getting people yeah. to understand how to manage through some of the, for example, anti-Asian sentiment, even yeah. correcting colleagues and saying, you know, how do you decouple the way they talk about COVID from at the very beginning, the Asian flu or the, the Chinese flu? It mattered because our colleagues would call me and say, that's how our leaders are describing it. And it felt mm -hmm. awkward and there's a tension there. Yeah. Um, but coming back to your original question, the leadership challenges that um, women of color face, the pressure's high on females and, and minority leaders, as you know. Um, you know, with the recruiting aspect, there's a prevailing belief that women and minority leaders might be promoted because of gender or race. Mm -hmm. not, be not, be not because of their qualifications or right. their capabilities, right? Right, right. And so it makes it harder for female and minority leaders to be seen and appreciated. And so they're under a lot of pressure. So I think I was reading a recent study from Corn Ferry that talked about how 60% of black leaders report mm. having to work twice as hard oh, yeah. or accomplish twice as much as their yep. peers. Yeah. Just to be viewed at the same level, right? Right, right. Double and work. Even, yeah. And even when they succeed, they have to repeat that success over mm -hmm. and over again. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they're able to get promoted or permitted to climb that corporate ladder. You know that you've heard it. Mm -hmm. so, and then it's even harder for minority women being members of two underrepresented groups. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, when I think about some of the coping mechanisms that you asked about, I think it's it's that immigrant mentality. You came from Nigeria. Yes. And it's, it's ingrained in us, right? Yes. <laughs> I think I think you're you're always been told and it's a given go where the opportunities are right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. what I I always did was I relocated whenever I there was an opportunity because I knew that that was that was something that we just did and Absolutely. I wanted to because Absolutely. it would help me it help us advance our careers right and it really didn't seem like taking a risk it wasn't a conscious decision but what I told myself each time was what skills would I learn more mm. about and 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 mm. how could I improve myself and and maybe I'll learn something about what I'm interested in right mm -hmm. and what I did learn is that it helped me embrace uncertainty mm -hmm. and you got more confidence along the way and I learned to believe in myself and wow. it was just that appetite to learn and you never thought about failure as an option because you just built a strong network around you of friends and peers and support folks who would just make sure that um, you could learn along the way. You didn't feel alone. Oh, wow. I mean, that's extremely well said. I, I think the last part resonates the most with me because I think regardless of where you live, whether it's in a big city like New York City or it's in Madison, Wisconsin, the one thing that we all have in common is that need for support. And, and also the people that have supported us over the years. We mentioned uh, Ellen Wenger, the wonderful Ellen, earlier on as, you know, who has been a leadership consultant to the both of us. Do you have any notable mentors that have helped to shape your career journey to date? That's a great question. And Ellen, she's fantastic. She's a yes. master at her craft, isn't she? Absolutely. No one is better, at least in my opinion, but that's my thought. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I think it is the support that you have. And, you know, you you and I have been in touch since I've moved from New York, and it doesn't yes. feel like we're that far away because we're all no. connected right now. Yes. I mean, that's the power of Zoom. Say what you want. I mean, virtual networks really matter as well. Completely. And I love the idea of mentorship. And I've had so many great mentors that have shaped my career journey, including some of the peer mentors you and I are going to stay in touch. I know, you know, <laughs> past leaders I've had as well. But where I get a lot of my fulfillment is through my mentees. It's, mm. it's almost um, what you hear mm. about the reverse mentor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and so for me, connecting with my mentees routinely gives me the opportunity to learn from them. And I've always done that. So even in my current job, I've been here two and a half years, I can call them anytime. I remember meeting this one person who was in revenue cycle the first week because she won this raffle um, mm -hmm. to have lunch with the CEO. And I can call her anytime to be educated on so many things in the lab, you know, at the at when what's happening in the front line in a much more granular way than any high level manager can give to me. Wow. So it's, it's remarkable. Yeah. Or just, just, I mean, think about it, just staying in touch with, you know, former direct reports or people across the organization, they can give me feedback on my leadership style, my communication style, how I should be approaching things that will resonate best with their peers and their groups. And, um, and they just give us fresh perspectives that we can bring back to the leadership team. So I really love the reverse mentor idea. 
Well, that's one of the things I absolutely adore about you is your receptivity to information. There's no uh, sort of, uh, I'm pompous, I'm too arrogant to learn from someone because that's such a level and this is me. I think that knowledge is truly universal and we have a lot to learn and there's diversity of thought, right? Being able to learn from people from different backgrounds, different age groups and such. So I really applaud you on that. It says a lot about the kind of leader that you are. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. So let's bring it back to innovation again. Um, earlier on, you defined scientific innovation. You tied it back to your work at Exact Science. It's essentially, it's around impact. How do we change lives? So when we think about key factors that are important for sustaining innovation in the life science industry, do you have a few that you could share with us today? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I think to deliver that life-changing innovation, you need three things. You need mm. you know, the right science and technology for every mm -hmm. challenge. We need proven expertise and we need the ability to develop solutions. And for us, it's from early detection to treatment. Wow. And our team here is remarkable. They really aim to offer that comprehensive suite of tests mm -hmm. that enabled that delivery of personalized care mm -hmm. across the cancer continuum. Mm -hmm. And so we have five clinical labs here that work wow. to improve our current tests. And so, like I said, we've grown to last over the two years and they're they're here, um, they're across the country. We've got our lab here in Madison, in San Francisco Bay Area, in the Cambridge area, in the Johns Hopkins area. Um, and we've got a world-class R&D team that has a proven track record um, of developing and launching cancer tests. And this team approaches every challenge with the right science and technology, mm -hmm. their mm -hmm. deep expertise and their resourcefulness, all in the name of changing people's lives. Um, and so we not only strive to detect cancer, but offer people specific and guided cancer treatment options. I love that. I think the personalized aspect is what perhaps resonates with me because we are really in this age of the data enabled patient, the patient that is empowered, getting in front and asking questions. And I cannot emphasize enough as a former cancer research a researcher, as you remember, I was trained at Yale and, and my PhD was really focused in molecular oncology, go out there, uh, get screened, early and that's how we we stay alive and that's how we save lives and most importantly that's how we change lives so uh thank you for sharing that now in closing do you have any other thoughts or commentary that you'd like to share with our audience today oh well first of all thank you so much sophia <laughs> this is such a great platform you give us all a great learning opportunity for for myself and all your listeners and i've seen you know what your your platform can do um, Thank you. Of course. And when I think about uh, the future of exact sciences, we have so many exciting things coming in our pipeline. That multi-cancer screening test that I mentioned has the potential to make screening through a single blood draw. That's game changing for wow. so many types of cancer. And that's going to be a reality soon. Wow. Um, and our goal is to help close that massive screening gap that exists today in about 70% of the cancers that have no current treatment. Um, screening methods. So we're collaborating with, I mentioned, um, the Mayo Clinic, Johns Hopkins University, TGen, the Translational Genomics Research Institute, and others to develop these new cancer detection tests that helps us detect cancer at the earliest and the most treatable stages when we, when we can impact lives. Um, and we're developing solutions for minimal residual disease, you know, MRD testing. And overall, we're just excited about the future of exact sciences, and there's so much more to come. So. Yeah, no, there's a lot more to come, and I'm excited that you're giving us this platform to talk about it. It's my absolute pleasure. Thank you for gracing us today with your presence and your knowledge. I look forward to staying in touch with you, and hopefully we can bring you back to the show in a few years to let us know how great things continue to go at Exact Sciences. So thank you again. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me, and uh, this is a great platform. So happy holidays, Sophia. <laughs> I wish you the same. Take care, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Bye -bye. Take care.